so the idea is that we'll go through we floated some questions these are kind of common questions i think that people have about mantle of the expert um and questions that people asked dorothy as well and we thought we'd go through some of these questions and give our thoughts about it and then we'd have some breakout rooms where we can find out a bit more about you and what your needs are or what questions you have or where you are in your journey with mantle of the expert and um, what help you might need in future or you'd like to have from the network because we're looking at forming a group in the autumn of people who can support each other and plan together maybe and and it's we haven't established exactly the form that that will take um so we're really looking for this conversation with you about what you'd like really from the network and so really first of all the question is what is mantle um you know, in a nutshell you're asking people to think of themselves as an expert team of some sort um like there are people running a museum or a travel agent and the the fictional context is chosen by the teacher to meet their learning needs their teaching needs their curriculum but the and at a certain point a client is introduced who commissions this team to do a big job so it might be they're running a museum they're commissioned by somebody to produce an exhibition about ancient Egypt. As far as the children are concerned, they are running a museum. But of course, along the way, they're learning a great deal about ancient Egypt, which is the teacher's learning aim for the group. Um, I think that it involves a quite radical shift in the way you think about teaching and the way you think about learning, if you really take it on, because it is really moving away from the standard model of education that we certainly have in the UK and I think through the world of um, the trans what Dorothy called the transmission model, where the teacher is the one who knows and the teacher is the one who imparts this knowledge to the children who take it in. It shifts all of that. And it it's children are no longer doing things for the teacher. They're doing it for their team, for their company, they're doing it for their client. They understand it's fictional, but um, they are no longer doing it because teacher says, now what I want you to do now is this. They're doing it because there's a purpose, there's a context, there's a client who needs this job doing. So one of the, the questions that we have really, or that comes up a lot is, okay, so why use Mantle? Because this is a shift and it's a power shift. And it is a shift in the, for the teachers that I've worked with, I'm aware that it's a, it's a shift for them in the way they teach and the way they work. So why would you use Mantle? Does somebody want to come in and say why they think you would use Mantle rather than, because I'm sure that for many teachers, it seems the quickest way of teaching, the most obvious way of teaching is tell them what they need to know. Somebody like to come in. I mean, I think, can I come in? Yeah. I mean, I think, I just think one of the, I mean, there's lots of reasons, but one of the reasons I'm, I'm thinking is when it's a transmission model, as you said, I, I think uh, Dorothy felt very much that being told something didn't mean to say you, you understood it. And the emphasis on transmission is about the teacher telling, whereas in Mantle, I think it's about the young people experiencing um, a, a sense of responsibility of the work for somebody else. And because of that, I think they become knowers and doers, if you like, and, and they become, I suppose, um, they become to, to realise things as well. And I think learning is about sort of that shift that people make themselves, that they there's a difference between knowing something and realising it. And so I, I think that, for me anyway, is, is a very useful reason why you would use mantle um, because it's about learning rather than about some teaching that's out there and nothing to do with you. That's my take on it anyway, or one take on it. Yeah, I think you're right. It's the context that makes the shift. Hmm. 
Uh, Matika, yes, you've raised your hand. Yes, I also feel what I've noticed is when, because they're doing it, and this knowledge then retains with them because they have researched, they have come up with all this knowledge. So it lasts forever. And then they understand themselves because they have explored it. Yes. Yes. And also it creates opportunities for discovery, I think. And learning by discovery stays longer. I mean, taking from what many guys say. Yes. Also, I feel uh, the most fantastic thing about Mantle is um, just the amalgamation of all subjects uh, together and um, learners and facilitators just sort of going in hand in hand and sort of again discovering together. everything about it uh, so for example David uh, you mentioned the Egypt project and I've done that I've taken that mantle project from the mantle website and the amount of drama and the amount of knowledge um, we've designed things we've written letters and the the way they they the, the children have used um you know multiple intelligences to sort of come come up with uh solutions or come up with anything that was uh, a part of that mantle was just amazing so i think for me um I, the the reason i love uh, using mantle and i'm so fascinated by it is that you can just mix up all the subjects that are supposed to be, uh, you know, separate from each other. Um, in, in, school, a, in, in a traditional yeah, system. In a, in a yeah, in a traditional school. But, I mean, you can all mix it up and you can do it together. You don't need, need a maths period and you don't need an English class separate from one another. So that's why I uh, love practicing it. It's great to hear. I'm very excited by these pioneers throughout the world going ahead and doing mantle and getting excited by it and enthused by it. It's great. So uh, there was a question um, about how do you... Let me just, I just want to add something, Doug. Go on. Go on, Brian. Um, I think the thing I would add, is you've, everybody's talked about learning. Um, I think for me, um, because it transforms teaching, it transforms your relationship with the students so um if you're not in a transmission model what what are you in well um i've been thinking recently about different metaphors for teaching and one is the journey so it's like going on a journey with students with the children and you're you're you, you take on like a leadership role you're like planning a journey but you're going on it with them not um doing it to them um so the change in your relationship and i think that's i'm sure we'll come on to this lots of times why doesn't everybody do this <laughs> <laughs> um and part of the answer to that is um you, you you can't retreat into that um i know what i'm doing and i'm going to tell you you know what i already know um yeah. if you're going on a journey with students um then you have to be open to what actually actually happens on the way not what is on the lesson plan that you're trying to follow which somebody else has given to you um so the relationship is it is um you you can do a, a a facsimile of mantle um for about 10 minutes <laughs> um but if you actually move into um what the what the system is you're going to have to um, change their relationship so that's I think that's uh, teaching and it's right up there with learning so yeah I think if you take it on board really take it on board it does change you as a as a teacher but I know Dorothy used to talk about she was aware that for people coming to it new maybe particularly it's like standing over a sort of abyss you know it looks very scary to begin with because you don't know your route through that journey so there was a question we were that comes up a lot how do you start a mantle um lisa and richard you had some one of you had some thoughts on this i think yeah we start lots of mantles at woodrow first school um each class starts a different mantle every term um and they don't they don't repeat it because it's always a different story so we start often by telling the children that 
it's a loose to what Brian was saying, we're going to tell a story together. And there are many, many ways of, of starting. And there's no one way, I guess. But first and foremost, I think it has to interest the children and it has to attract the children to what you're going to be doing. Um, and they will have to end up having a concern with it. So you could start with the iconic. You could start with a picture, a photo. You could start with a a large painting, or you could have a drawing in the making. You could be, you could be doing the drawing with the children. You could start with a map, a lot of small size map, large size map, because there's always interesting things in maps. You could start with a symbolic, maybe a letter, an email, a report, a text message, social media, and all of those different forms can be read in different ways to interest and attract the children. You could start with a box that arrives in the classroom. Should we open it? Who's it to? What could be inside it? Who might need this? Who might this be important to? You could begin by unveiling something, a mystery object. And I think something that's, that's key to this is don't ask questions at the beginning that children can say no to, unless you're happy to accept the fact that they don't want to do it. Another way is starting with imagine if and leading in from there. You could start with a meeting, a meeting of the team, or a sign that says do not enter unless authorised. And therefore, we become the authorised ones. You might start with an advert. You could retell something that's just happened and the children need to join you with that. You could activate an adult in role or something that the children can do quickly and easily. A little drawing, a little piece of writing. But I think the key to all of it is the language that you use. And it's the language of induction, it's this language of come and join us, let's talk and work together. So it's we, it's us, it's not you, it's we and us, let us, how about trying this? So there's some ways to start the mantle. Yeah, it's, it's a lure to engage them in the subject, isn't it? Because you've set it up yourself, but you've got to get them engaged. Um, but I think what you're also talking about is it's this, what Dorothy called the crucible model of educational learning, that it were, it's not the teacher telling, it's we're all in this together, stirring it around together, exploring it together. We are doing it together. And I think that's one of the things that you're really establishing upfront at the start, is that idea of we're exploring it. We've got, we can all contribute I mean, that's a very different shift in itself for the teacher. And I was working with a teacher once who um, we were looking at some um, pictures of Victorian toys. And uh, we were exploring what could these toys be? And a boy that focused on one of the toys and gave his answer to what he thought it was and how it worked. And... I said, and it wasn't right, but it was a very good idea that he had about it. And I said, yeah, that could be, yes, I can see what you mean there. I mean, we can check this obviously on online or something because I knew it wasn't right, but it's still, he was coming up really thinking for himself. And the teacher later said to me, I should have told that child that he was wrong because she said, that's what education is. It's teaching kids what's right and what's wrong. It's teaching them the facts. Does anyone else want to come in then on thoughts about starting a mantle and what you're setting up at the start? Uh, I can share what I did. Okay. So um, I, and I discussed it with David also. So, you know, I, as a teacher, I feel that students um, are really impacted by social media and their image. Um, and so I just was thinking that how to, you know, bring this, thing up and by learning a little bit about mantle through the workshop I had with David. Um, I decided we're going to make them interior designers. 
And now I had to uh, initiate this idea. And I was in a room that needed uh, some designing and some help. So I generally, you know, in discussion, I started that uh, this is my room and I would want to redesign it. So will you help me with this? And that's how it started. And they became interior designers. And then later they got a letter from a school uh, wherein um, the school, uh, they had a hostel where this girl had written a poem about um, her anxieties in social media and how the principal now wanted the designers to redesign the, the, the hostel so that the students are not involved in the phones. But, you know, they, they have more activities, physical activities to do inside the hostel so that they're not involved in the phones and there's more air, thought to think. And yeah, so I started with showing my own room and and then, you know, they, they own that project that, oh, we are helping our teacher to re redesign her room. Yeah, yeah, it's making, it's you're starting off, you're making them active from the start, aren't you? You're giving them the ownership of, as you say, of the project, they've got a they've got a job to do, and they're responsible. They're active in it. Um, yes, and it's sort of it's very exciting, I think, for teachers actually to be creating these these openings, these lures that will interest people. Because it's not some you are being creative. It's not something you're taking as a scheme of work off a off a shelf or from the internet. You are being creative um, yourself, and I find that exciting. I find the starts can be really a fun part of the whole project just how do we get into it any other thoughts on that before we move on i just wanted to add the importance uh, of if possible knowing the students in advance and try to pick up a theme for the story for the narrative that you think they might enjoy if you know the group in advance if you don't know the group in advance which sometimes happens because you're going somewhere and you're going to work with teachers you've never worked before with a group you've never worked before it's, it's good to, to think about the a general context that they will all be at it or inside of it somehow. So you you grab that the interest from the beginning and you start asking questions about the, the main theme you're going to work on or something um, or either questioning or bringing something as Richard uh, suggested uh, with ideas how you, you can start it. So thinking about the group is also something very important before you start your month. And I see. Raise your hand. Oh, yeah. Hello. Uh, so, uh, in my uh, this thing experience of trying mantle, um, it has always been an interesting start, as you said, David, because it's something so practical where the child, where a group of children have the possibility of of you know trying something in real life. I think that is the most exciting element whenever we give them an opportunity to think and be like experts and bring their ideology or ideas to create things. I think that is the biggest hope point, which any group enjoys. And yes, I have used a lot of pictures uh, for that matter. And the kind of inferences, like just the very start in half an hour, I felt as if they were really talking with so much of conviction. I really didn't have to push them to make them feel that they were part of that image or they were in that era. It was very, I would say, very smooth. And it was like the first time I was handling a group of uh, 20 students doing it. So I had my own, you know, questions. Will this really transcend? They were an adult group. Will they really believe if I asked them to? But actually they did. And then we went into some writing work, which kind of double proof my expectation that, yes, what they actually thought, it's there with them. And further on, we explored more. So I think the biggest thing which I wanted to share is to do something real life. That is the biggest uh, gain what a group of children, anyone engaging with mantle will gain. Yeah. I mean, it's based in um, deep play, as Dorothy would say. It's based in it's based in the idea of let's as if let's let's agree to be in this fictional world. And it is something that kids just as you found yourself, they just go for it. They will accept that and they will go for it um and children can behave very differently then suddenly you know because they are because they've been given that power that space brian oh i just wanted to add um dorothy's idea of the other and how essential that is at the beginning especially um and as richard was saying um you know choosing all those ways that richard listed which was a fantastic list um it's all giving you something to look at or relate to, which is other than you. 
And and even if you're um, pretending to be somebody else, they're not looking at you as the teacher. They're interact. So it's this idea of us, us, the we ness, re relating to something together, and, and this is this we ness of, um, it, it's it, it's so um, again that's part of that shift. Um, if teachers are used to, I'm at the front and I'm saying something, and you're supposed to listen to me, um. And you, I think one of the problems when you that, that I find with teachers who begin with this is that they, it, if they don't really get that, that you've got to do this together, looking at something else, you can find even though you're, you know, you might be saying the things like, oh, how don't we run this, whatever it is, but the relationship is still focused on me as the teacher, whereas if it's we are looking into this other world. Because it's another world you're looking into, not just an icon or a. Um, you're, and um, the other thing I'd say is, I think the beginning is the hardest, um, which is a shame, really, because it'd be great to have the beginning easy. Because uh, <laughs> um, so, if you get it right, w within ten minutes, you can actually be involved in something with the children whatever whatever it is we're we're now as if we're inside this other world for a minute two minutes and then we can step out and talk about it and think oh where should we go next or what what should we do next or what, if you have something ready whatever it is and i'm talking in abstract terms because these are principles i think that apply no matter no matter what you're doing um the other thing i would say which to back to relationship with the students is the the first rule of improvisation, which is yes and. So whatever happens, you have to say yes to it. Um, and what can we do with that? Um, which includes something that goes wrong because you just say yes to it and then you go, oh, do you want to keep that in our story? <laughs> whatever so um it, it's back to that relationship between you and and the uh, the children um that's that's absolutely pivotal so there you go yeah the other is a key element i think i mean the client is the big other really in the whole thing because you're doing it for this client even though you know it's fictional you take it on as if it's real or the children do uh vishaka and Bhat charlie have got their hand raised hello it's just a small thing that um, came from what Brian was saying, taking off basically into the mental. Uh, and it, it's literally like that, that you feel a little unsettled as a teacher and you've kind of started it. And then it takes a little while to get a hang of what's going to happen. Uh, because earlier when I was not part of the mental network, I did not know that there was something like this. Um, I would just blindly copy uh, what Dorothy would do. And there were very few um, YouTube videos available then. Uh, so there was one where D Dorothy would say that, okay, what do you want to do today? Like what play do you want to make today? So I would just blindly copy her and go and ask my children, what do you want to do today? And uh, then with whatever answer would come, we would begin. And then it would take a while, about 15 to 20 minutes to, for me to figure out, okay, to look at the direction where it's going. So I think that happens still, even if we have, um, you know, a, 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 an iconic symbolic or um, you know, anything that we start with, uh, uh, the drama uh, mantle. Uh, but uh, taking off is a little, you know, deliberate. Uh, it happens still. So, uh, yeah, I just adding to what Brian was talking about. Yeah, I mean, that was Dorothy in her early years was famous for that, for going into a group and saying, what do you want to do a play about? And I tell you, Vaishali, that's the scariest way of approaching yes, working yes, with a group. Yes. And it's I've just, done what, this for, what, what, yeah, for five years straight, I've just done this. Yeah. <laughs> they come up with something they say we want to be prisoners of war or whatever and you've got yeah, to do yeah, it on the yeah. spot that's really scary but i mean <laughs> if you're not if you're going to have some kind of plan to begin with that you you've got to find ways as as richard and others have been saying of, of yeah, attracting yeah, yeah. them into it of luring them into it so they feel that it's theirs it's it is their play in the end they feel it that 
So, um, another question. Oh, sorry. Go on, go no, on, I was just going to say that I was thinking about what you're saying about, you know, what, what you want to play about. Um, it doesn't have to be a verbal question, really. You know, I'm just thinking about the people I worked with in Wales. Um, and it was, I think, what I'm learning more to do is like observing your students and your children and finding out, you know, what they do, what they what engage in, what's interesting to them. And I was thinking about one of my um, students who loved to draw, didn't want to speak at all, didn't want to get involved at all, but loved drawing and giving him a camera and he starts taking pictures. And, you know, the, you, for me, then I'm thinking, yeah, the group are into this, you know, maybe they could become filmmakers or something in a mantle term, they could become that. So I'm just, I think sometimes, you know, we, we kind of perhaps focus a bit, it doesn't have to be verbal, you know, what you want to play, but it's a very direct question, isn't it? And it's, it's, I would find that hard to answer in a group as well, you know, and that's problematic. So I think it's like looking at, you know, what, watching your kids, observing your kids and, and, and finding out from that, I think is kind of a, another dimension to it, really. Great. I think I just wanted to add on to Jonas, um, you know, and, and Dorothy mentioned about taking time to build the context, the fictional context with the children, mm. to build that belief. So it is okay to explore and observe the children initially and taking time for them to build that character, building that place, the atmosphere, and spending time to form that identification and resonance with it, you know, whatever that they're doing. So I, I often advise teachers not to rush into a specific focus in, or, 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 or area until, you know, they kind of build, take their time to build that with the children. I think you're right, absolutely, that you should, you need to have that time at the start. And of course, time is something that teachers feel they don't have nowadays. So we'll come back to that question of time. Um, how do you plan it? There's another question that what well, it comes up. So how do you how do you plan this? It's not like you can get schemes of work for it. I mean, we can have there are models of mantle projects, but I think it always needs to be tailored for the group you're with. So back to Lisa and Richard, I think you have some thoughts on this because obviously you're doing this all the time. You're a school that does a lot of its teaching through mantle. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I think we've got sort of I would say three layers of planning, maybe. So um, the, the long term plan is what we start with. And we do use the model in Tim Taylor's book, Beginner's Guide to Mantle of the Expert. And we take a few weeks to uh, sort of plan our long term plan for the mantle. And we do this because we come up with lots of ideas and there are ideas for mantle everywhere around you, in books, on the news, uh, just in chats with people. And we take a few weeks to, to sort of ponder these ideas and, and, and mull them around, um, linked to the curriculum that we need to teach at this point. So we've got those two things that we start with. What is the curriculum? And okay, let's think of some ideas and let's see what's around us that, um, might be a way into the curriculum with the children and we definitely are thinking what is going to interest the children but also what's going to interest me as the teacher what am I going to enjoy about this mantle um, with the children and um, we always talk to each other at school so we're saying you know maybe oh we want to do a mantle on um, animals in the forest um, anyone got anyone got any ideas and we do lots of chatting around that. So yes, even yesterday on the TV, I was watching Gogglebox of all things, and there was a program on, and there were some giraffes on an island, and the island got flooded and split into two, and one giraffe was left on its own. This is like a real life story. And um, the people had to then move the giraffe. And straight away I'm thinking, what a great mantle. How do you move a giraffe? Who moves a giraffe? You know, what's, What's going on there? So I think the ideas are all around you and you need to allow yourself time to think about it before you start uh, pinning one down. Um, then at that long-term um, planning stage as well, then we think about the elements of Manchester the Expert Commission. So what needs to be done? The client has, has already been mentioned, obviously. Are they a high authority client? You know, are they demanding something? 
of the team? Or are they a low authority client? Do they need our help? Um, you get very different responses from the children, depending on how you position the, the client. And for us, we're thinking about concern. Who matters in this mantle? And you know why, what matters to them? Um, and then we plan the start in detail. So as everyone said, the start is not easy. And I agree. And we take a lot of time to plan the beginning in detail. And we almost still, even now, sort of 12, 13 years down the line, almost write ourselves a script, each teacher for the beginning of the mantle, because we want to get it right, or as right as we can do. Um, and we want to get the language right at the beginning. Um, and as Richard said, and as everyone said, very much we've got a curriculum focus there um, at the front of our, our front of our minds. Um, we have in our plan then lots of possibilities. So the the start, the beginning is very uh, sure in the teacher's mind, but then we have a list of where we think uh, the mantle might go. What sorts of things might the team come across? what tensions might come up because without tensions you're working on a project you're not working on mantle of the experts so what tensions might come up um, so sometimes as a teacher you might be a bit frustrated because once you get into mantle these possibilities do not come up in the work or these tensions but it's important to have them there um, because if things start to stall further down the line, you've got that thinking there already. Um, you can just pick it up and run with it. Um, and we find that if, you, if you're thinking about what team, what responsible team the children are going to be, try and give them quite a, a wide remit. So, you know, they might be a transport team. Uh, they might be um, a rehabilitation team so that there are lots of different possibilities that might come up from the team. That certainly works for us in school anyway. Um, the second sort of layer of planning is in and after the lessons. So you might have spent a couple of hours in your class, if you're lucky to have a couple of hours, I know, um, working on Mantle. And then at the end of the day, you're going to then have to reflect on what's happened, where are we at, where do we go next? Um, and that's when you can look back at your original plans and see, have we got an inquiry question? Have we got a possibility? That's where you look at Dorothy Heathcote's conventions. What convention might we use next to move the story on, to introduce attention? Um, as, a, as a busy um, looking at viewpoints, is there a different viewpoint we can introduce uh, here? And as a busy teacher, that is a challenge um, because you've got lots of things to do at the end of a day. You've got marking, you've got lots, you know, your maths lessons and things to prepare. But for us, we find that we have to do that as we're going along through the days and through the weeks. Um, we have notebooks. So after we've written down our first plan, um, and that's typed up usually, we then have notebooks. So we're making notes of what's going on with the children and we're making notes of what we might do, just um, our own scribbled notes. Um, then also there's planning to do within a lesson. So all the time we're trying to listen to the children, we're trying to watch, we're trying to respond to what they're saying, what they're doing, what they want to do. Um, and so we really had to learn the conventions of Mantle of the Expert. We really had to take a lot of time trying to learn them. So we tried to learn like maybe two or three um, so that within a lesson we could use a convention. We didn't have to um, go away and plan it. So we're trying to in the moment plan and in the moment respond. Um, Sometimes you need some space, obviously, and some time as the teacher. I don't know if everyone has this um, chance to do this, but in our school, we might send them out to play for 10 minutes and it gives the teacher 10 minutes thinking time to decide, okay, what should we do when the children come back in? Um, but yeah, all the time listening to the children and trying then to plan in the moment. So it, it's not 
easy. As uh, everyone said, and David said right at the beginning, it isn't a scheme that you can pick up and you know what you're doing tomorrow or next week. But for us, we know what we're doing at the start. We know the curriculum and that keeps us focused, that plan that we have at the start. And then the children guide us and we move through the mantle together. Can you just give us an example, Lisa, of a, of a tension? You talked about tension. So what exactly do you mean there? Um, let's see. So it might be a tension of um, time. It might be a, a tension of someone's uh, made a mistake um, in, in the team. You know, someone's let out a bit of information. Um, I'm trying to think of one. In uh, We had... Uh, Mantle this year, we were a, a rehabilitation team. We were um, gifted a piece of, of woodland and um, there was a mysterious creature in there. And attention was that someone in the team had um, put a photograph on social media. And this was, you know, this um, idea of this creature was trying to leak out. So that's one kind of tension. Um, you but, might be being watched yeah you might be being watched um within the tasks that you're doing so that becomes a tension in itself it's yeah it's like a disturbance almost isn't it it's like um we're trying to evoke something from the children so if things are going along nicely so maybe in the woodland you know we were we were there in our shelters we were watching the what was going on in the woodland it was all you know very nice and happy and then attention was that um someone found um, a skeleton there, for instance. So you're trying to disturb things a little bit, I would say, with attention. Okay. Well, there was a fenced off area we suddenly came across that, do we go inside? It's a problem to solve. So yeah. constantly ensuring that those are part of the story. I think and for I us, it, the danger is that you can slip into what might be described as project work. So, you know, this, there's the stories developing and the children are writing and they're doing tasks um, and the attention gives, injects a bit of life back into things. Okay. Makes you think of someone else's viewpoint, brings that um, concern level back up again. And that leaves the children wanting more. Because okay. right. that's why the children thrive with this work because they they want they want more they they love the tensions yeah there, there's a whole list of um, dorothy heathcote's levels of tension uh, but don't ask me to reel them all off because i have to have a look i have to i have to look at them yeah brian go on. oh i just wanted to add um uh thanks lisa that was a fantastic overview i love the three le three levels um, a couple of things that I really hold on to are um, it's like what you were saying at the, the first, uh, if I think of the difference in a plan and planning. Um, so planning is planning. I think of it as planning possibilities. So I'm thinking this might happen. This might happen. This is, these are all possibilities, but you have to be, you have to begin with something. You can't, as, as we were saying, going in and saying, what do you want to do is like, it's like you've thrown the plan to the children, um, which is not a good idea. Um, uh, the other thing is something I came up with years and years ago, and I often just come back to it, is the ABC. So the A is we're all doing this together. So there's the whole team thing, and we're all going into the same world. The B is a big problem. It has to be, there has to be a big problem there, and it's... We were just saying that's that's one of the fundamental ways of bringing tension in, um, because with a big problem, there's always multiple ways of looking at it, and something else, somebody else looks at it in a different way, and then the C is you have to care about it. So if we if and this your example of you know who wouldn't care about moving a giraffe from one? <laughs> I love that story. Is that so? When you when when I'm thinking about what would we what might we do, those three really come up for me. Would would they care about this? Is this something that they actually want to do? As opposed to, you know, it's yes, of course, the curriculum or whatever is you've got to be 
do that, but you can do all the most amazing things out of curriculum, but they don't care about it. It's dead before you begin. So um, anyway, that's my, some of my thoughts. Yeah, that's neat, Brian, ABC. I like that. Key points to keep in mind. Um, because I'm aware of time, I was thinking of moving on to the next question. I think Cecily had her hand up, David, oh, sorry. Cecily had her hand up. I can't oh, see that. Right. Okay, Cecily. Um, this is absolutely fascinating. Yeah. It's wonderful to see such a tremendous group of people. I feel I've learned an enormous amount in the last few minutes even. Uh, lovely to see Brian, um, my old pal from Columbus. Uh, and, um, and also there were some wonderful words just came out. Uh, a disturbance. I mean, what a lovely idea. Whatever you're doing, it's a disturbance. If you're doing a project, then you don't expect, I guess, a disturbance. But um, um, it has to be a big problem. Uh, and theatre is the same, isn't it? And Dorothy had theatre in her bones. You know, theatre is never about somebody having a lovely day and, you know, sleeping well and lovely breakfast. No, something happens, something big. And um, then it's our responsibility to deal with that. And then other wonderful things, the attitudes that Dorothy was able to um, provide, the perspectives. And I'm by no means an expert in mantle, you know. Um, it's, it's not really um, kind of what I do. I did attempt some recently, uh, but um, I, it dawned on me how, um, in a way, uh, how much it requires of me uh, and all the things that people have said, the acceptance, and Dorothy was a genius at that, not, as you were saying, David, not putting a child right because they've actually got the answer wrong, but um, accepting it and finding another way to put them right at, at maybe a later stage. Um, the language Dorothy used and the language that is echoed by everybody who's spoken here, um, that sense of uh, never talking down to the kids, presenting them with the big problem or the disturbance, but doing it not as if you were talking down to them, but that you are a team, as Brian said. So uh, thank you very much, everybody. I've, as I say, it's, um, it's already been a learning experience for me. Well, thank you, Cecily. I mean, yes, it is absolutely. That is really a shift for teachers that you have to think team all the time. You have to think colleague, you have to talk to people as as you would to colleagues. You have to lose teacher talk the way that teachers always talk. Yeah, I was going to ask if you'd done mantle because I wasn't sure if you had or not. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I was asked to do a session fairly recently um, in Southampton for a group of people who were outreach work workers, you know, we're going into schools and helping new theatres and that kind of thing uh, at the big theatre there. And um, they particularly were interested in Dorothy's work. So um, I looked at the frames of power and I also looked at uh, <clears throat> what could, what big question could we get into? And um, in 1840 something, uh, there was a cholera outbreak in Southampton. And for those that don't know Southampton, it's a big, busy port. Uh, with people coming from all over the world and um, the cholera broke out rather severely and nobody knew at the time whether it was airborne or bacteria and um, there were all sorts of ideas about that so I, I did the research, I got all the bits of paper that you know which districts suffered and uh, what the authorities did about it and uh, you know descriptions of the first um, uh, fatalities people turn blue it's called the blue plague and um and um and i asked the group to be uh researchers but of course in a funny sort of way i'd done the research that that really hadn't helped but they looked at my research and um and uh i kind of they were interested and you know they you know made some good comments and so on but um it was so hard to find the tension that people have spoken about. Uh, and um, I kind of couldn't get it to kind of flow in the way that 
a good piece of drama in whatever mode um, until I did the who's to blame question. <laughs> and that, that was the disturbance, that was the tension. Um, I can't say it was a brilliant piece of work, but um, I uh, at least got us all in the same um, kind of condition, except that I wasn't part of the team. I was the person, um, you know, who was trying to uh, prod them, as it were, into finding where the blame lay. And I'm not sure if that's still mantle or not, but it was fine. And um, I think they I think they got something out of it. Um, I hope so. Um, but again, time, uh, you know, the curse of every drama teacher everywhere um, was against me. It wasn't like I could go in the following week and see what they'd done. You know, it was, uh, you know, an hour and something had to happen. That's my excuse. But I have to say, that it reminded me of how difficult it is to, as it were, um, calibrate what you're doing so that the team is created and they have a task. There's always a task in Dorothy's work, isn't there? And that the perspectives are such that they can uh, kind of, uh, um, they have a reason to inquire into what the difficulty is or what the disturbance is. So um, I'm sure, I'm sure anybody in this group could give me good advice on how I maybe could have proceeded with more um, success, shall I say. Because success is not a word that Dorothy would allow anybody to use about a lesson. I once said to her, um, uh, do you ever feel that a lesson uh, hasn't gone well, that it's failed? And she was quite cross with me and said, Absolutely not. He said, who, who am I to say it's failed? You know, it, it will have reached some, it won't have reached other, others. You know, it, it's, that's not a valid question, more or less, she told me. So that was me told off. But I think you, it sounds like what you did was right in the, the project, in what the drama you were talking about. Because if they're, sim if they're simply a commission and there's research to be done, then that is really a project, isn't it? It's like, a, it, there, there isn't that that real need to do it. It is that problem that, that Brian talked about. What is the big problem that yeah. you then injected into it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that was the right. trouble. And, and the person who'd done the research was me. So, hey, I learned them all. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, shall we move on? Richard, are, are you going to answer the next question, which is about how you integrate maths and English and the teaching aims you have there so how you're hitting these targets, I suppose, that the, the curriculum demands. Yeah, so this is, this is where um, I think we might um, diverge from, from others. I think often with English and maths, you have to teach outside of the fiction and you have to teach what you want the children to learn outside of the fiction. But it can be about the mantle, it can be about the story, or something that you want doing in the future within the story. And then you can apply it within the mantle. So I think that's where learning can be deepened through using mantle with English, maths and science. Or you can flip that around and create things that have to be learned and known for your story and for your mantle. So there the, the might be something outside of the fiction that you have to do to move the story on with the children. So there are always writing opportunities. The writing opportunities, letters to the client, emails to the client. There are opportunities um, to write reports. The newspaper might uh, uh, need, need a report that you produced out of the story and you can use it within the story. So I think for an awful lot of English, science and mathematics that we will use the opportunities outside of the story in the is world and then apply them within the if world of the mantle. So we want to make sure that rather than giving the children 
lots of contrivances within their work that we keep it meaningful. And it can be only meaningful, I think, if it's planned for very, very carefully. So it's very, very tricky to produce lots and lots of math, science and English within the story. But one example I can think of where we did have a giant who was very angry and the, the giant was, was furious. He was growling and making all sorts of noises. And the only way the team could find out about the giant was going into the portal and seeing the giant in the world that the giant lived in. And the reason the giant was so angry was because the giant had toothache. So the team had to come out of the story, find out about teeth, find out about canines, molars, incisors and the like, and then go back into the story to work out which tooth was giving the giant problems. So that's how you can use science within the story from without of the story. But I do think it needs really careful planning and really careful thinking about. Tara. Um, that was a great example there. I have um, more to sorry, say. Oh, I'm muted, am I? No, 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 sorry. you're all right. Yeah. All right. No, I was just thinking about the using science because I'm coming from a practitioner's point of view where I'm not always familiar with what part of the curriculum is being studied. And so I'm relying on the teachers coming to me and saying, this is what we're doing at this moment. How can you use drama? And um, when I come in, say, as an artist in the classroom, whatever the, it might be in that moment. But I developed, and this is just an example, really, um, around the life cycle of a butterfly with early years children. Um, and we, we were looking at the life cycle of the butterfly, but it developed very much into identity. So how I approached it was around a caterpillar that did not know when they went into their cocoon if they were going to come out as a butterfly or a moth. Um, because during that time I had a lot of children saying, oh, if he comes out as a moth, we will not be friends with him because the children were framed as bugs in this, um, I think it was like a like a, I think it was like a bug committee. I can't remember the frame exactly at the time, but they were framed as bugs. And so they were all, you know, there were bees in the field or they were, you know, caterpillars or they were uh, ladybirds. And what they wanted to do is to try to uh, to find out about what it was like going through that cycle. So we, we, we looked at the science of the caterpillar turning into going into his cocoon and they studied how um, a, a moth's caterpillar a moth's cocoon is underground a butterfly's is above and what they ended up doing is um coming up with this full moon cocoon party so the whole uh, mantle was developed around they were going to have this full moon cocoon party and all would be revealed um but what they did was as well as you know studying those kind of steps in the development of this caterpillar. They were also looking at identity and what it meant to, you know, to feel maybe I won't come out beautiful. Maybe I have to look at the other skills. So they uh, ended up, we ended up doing a huge um, chunk of the, the mantle around what skills a moth had just in case he became a moth. And actually I left that to uh, the group. What, what, maybe that was a bit risky, what the caterpillar turned out to be. But uh, they looked at the length of the hair on the caterpillar. A certain length was going to be a moth. Um, the, the, the exact centimetres that that caterpillar would become if they were going to be a moth. And it was very interesting because um, we, a lot of the children as bugs were saying, I won't be friends. Like they were very strict in this. I will not be friends with this, uh, 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 this moth because they're so ugly. And it was just, it was really, really interesting because as a, a teacher, you're kind of hoping that they'll be on the side of the moth, and that, that they're going to be like, you know, come on the moth, you can fly backwards, you can see in the dark. And, you know, you're kind of equipping them with all of this information. But at the end of the day, the children are going to be 
who they are and they're going to tell you what it is that they believe and what they feel. Um, where am I going with this um, <laughs> ranting? But I, I thought that it was very interesting that like uh, my approach was to look at the science curriculum, but it became more of a mantle about identity and, you know, what it means to be human and to look at all of the aspects of our personality. Um, because I think that there is a lot of pressure. We assume it's just, the, well, we don't assume, but like the teenagers have the the, the pressure of social media and, I had worked with that group and they were coming in saying, you know, such and such said my hair is not long enough or I have to wear a unicorn dress because this, this is happening at five. You know, this is happening at four. This is happening at five. So it is important that all of those themes are explored in the early years. And I'm very interested in mantle in early years. That's my kind of area um, as Elaine and Richard and Lisa are also in that kind of area as well, you know, so, um, yeah, so if anybody else has examples as well of, of working in developing kind of mantles with early years, I'm really interested in hearing about that, so. Yeah, thanks, Tara. Thank I mean, one you. of the things about doing man math or English or science through mantle is, of course, it's then, it's in a context, it has a purpose for it. It's not what Dorothy would call a dummy run, which is simply doing something for the teacher because the teacher says we've got to do it. It's actually, there's always a purpose. And I think that changes it and it changes it, it, it moves it, I think, for the children into what Dorothy would call deep memory. They remember it because they, they, are, they need it and they are applying it. They're applying those skills in a context. Brian. Yeah, absolutely, David. I was just going to say that about purpose, that um, if you think about the, the other world that you're, that you're involved with, and you're always moving in and out of that what-if world and then back into the what-is world, the, the, you know, the classroom world, if you're looking in there, that's a huge other all, there all the time, which you're always looking into it. So as Richard was saying, when you're um w whatever you're doing on the curriculum it's for the purpose of using it yeah w whether or not you're doing it as if you're the team or as if you're in the classroom in a way it those overlap anyway but the reason you're doing it is to is to use it in some way so ev everything which is completely different than doing it because it's on the curriculum and it feels completely yeah. different oh. Um, and um, Cecily's example there of the, you know, the, all the cholera work, them looking at this incredibly complex stuff um, to try and understand who's to blame for this. Um, I mean, that's fantastic because you're looking into that. Um, so it's that, it's that looking in there and have, having a purpose. The other thing I just wanted to lift up, Tara, that you said at the end, was that if you hold on, if when if we remember that everything we're doing is part of being human, everything's humanizing, if you look for the humanity in it, and if you lose the humanity of it, it becomes a thing, not, it's, Dorothy said once about the difference between relating to things and relating to people, and everything really, um, if you see the humanity in it, then it then it comes to life. Then it's a big problem that we would care about with um, multiple different human human ways of looking at it. So, um, including butterflies <laughs> and moths. I love that. <laughs> Richard, yeah. yeah, Richard Kieran. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Yona talks about authenticity in the work an, an awful lot. And I think that's another opportunity um, where English can come, come in, into this. You know, if we want to use a letter within the story, we ensure that the children, if the children are writing it, or we're modelling it with the children and working with the children on this, then it has to be authentic enough and good enough to use within, within the story, or it has to be authentic enough and good enough for the client so that's where um, I think the high expectations come in to this work, the high demand comes into this work through the tasks that we're set and, and, and hopefully, you know, that's where the, the children will 
remember the things that they're doing. I think there's quite a bit of research at the moment on the importance of memory uh, and narrative and how the two can work so well together. So but I, I don't know if, Yoni, did you want to say anything about... Well, I was just, you would, I was just making, I was just thinking about what you said, you know, and, and talking about purpose and maybe if you're doing the letter out of the context or in or whatever, uh, a nice thing to do, and I've, I'm sure you used it as well, is, you know, you have the client, you have the client actually looking at the letter uh, and reading the letter that they've actually composed so they can listen in and maybe imagine, they might just be reading, it might just be the voice. It might be you reading the letter and the client looking at it and they watch the body language and imagine how are the client receiving our letter or how do we imagine the client will receive our letter? Or they might comment on some of the phrases. So I think that in a way extends that idea of purpose. It's sort of purpose in action, if you, if you like. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Because uh, very often in schools, I think we write letters or have children write letters and they don't go anywhere. <laughs> you know, they stay in their books. <laughs> so, yeah. I, you know, I think that makes it uh, more meaningful for them. It's for someone and it's someone yeah. you care about. You yeah, care. And you can use your drama convention to, you know, Imagine yeah. what they would say or do when they got it, you know, or they could all imagine what they'd say or do when they read it. So it, it, it brings that purpose to it, I think. Can I ask, for time reasons, because we do want to get into breakout rooms, can I ask uh, Richard and Lisa, there's two more questions we were going to look at. How do you plan it to fit in with the curriculum? And how do you sustain it within timetable constraints? Do you think you could answer those two questions together? I think you've answered quite a lot of them there. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we probably answered the how quite a bit of it. Quite a bit of it. Yeah. Did you to, did and you I think sometimes you've just got to accept that sometimes the curriculum that you've got to teach won't fit into the mantle. So, for instance, if, if the children have got to learn how to make a circuit, this is always one in year four, an electrical circuit, it just doesn't fit coherently or authentically into a responsible team where someone would need to make a circuit with a little tiny bulb. So sometimes you just have to teach something away from the mantle and accept it and just get it done, I would say. And I can, I, I mean, I will, I, sometimes we, we come up against this problem at school and I will come out uh, with an outlandish idea and context for fitting something into the story. And the teachers will look at me and go, what? Uh -huh. And that because they 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 see how um, incoherent it is. So uh, if it's not coherent with what you're doing, don't don't, don't try and and squeeze it in. Okay. Yeah. And the... So sustaining. The... Oh, sorry. Go on, David. Go on. No, no, no. Carry on, Lisa. Yeah. Oh, okay. I was going to talk about uh, sustaining the the mantle. We've tried to find a few little tricks because. Um, as the years have gone on, there seems to be less and less time uh, to be creative in an um, English school, shall we say. Um, but we, we just we work around the givens in our, our timetable that can't move. So, you know, if you're timetabled to do PE on a Tuesday, you have to stick with that. Um, but then in our school, we try to be as flexible as we can with the rest of the time in the curriculum. So we try to block out um, a good chunk of time for mantle. So we might do like two hours on a uh, Tuesday afternoon and then another couple of hours on a Wednesday morning. Uh, but then maybe we won't do anything on Thursday because we're doing computing or something. So we try to be flexible as much as we can and chunk time. We also try not to go more than a day without doing something for the mantle, no matter how small it might be. So keeping the mantle at the forefront of the children's uh, thinking. Some of the ways that we've done that are, um, so for instance, if we're doing some artwork um, and it's going to be for the mantle, whilst we're doing art, we're always talking about, oh, when we go back into mantle and we'll see this in the office or, you know, this, where will this be? We're trying to be talking about it as much as we can. Uh, we try to write the story of the mantle on pieces of card. We put them up on the wall. So if there's a day where there's some, a lot going on, we maybe will read the story together. And the older children love to read it. Um, so we're, we're narrating the story. We're keeping it fresh in our minds. 
we'll talk about we'll talk to children in the corridors about their mantle so you know the, the children are, are, are walking to lunch and you and you might say to them did, did you did you manage to find the dragon and straight away they'll turn into mantle mode and say, yeah it was it was it was at the bottom of the cave not the top of the cave are you coming to see it so well when i've got time i'll come and have a look at it so it's always it's just constantly giving the opportunity giving the children the opportunity to talk about what they're doing what enthralls them and what infuses them with it yeah that the walls of the classroom are telling the story of the mantle and they've got the history of the team there they've got the commission there so our classrooms do not have pretty lovely uh, displays in them they have all the little bits of paper and all the jottings and everything that's been going on in the mantle is up on the walls in the classroom. So they're surrounded by the mantle. Um, Fridays, we have an assembly where everyone gathers together and each class is talking about what's going on in their mantle. So those are some of the little sort of uh, tricks almost maybe. Um, but in terms of sustaining in, in, in the actual teaching and learning, that's when we come back to the plan, that original plan and having those lists of possibilities, having a lot of inquiry questions that we've got there that we can say, oh, OK, things are a, there's a bit of a lull here. Let's put in let's introduce this inquiry question or having the team that's got a wide remit because maybe there's a new commission that comes and that keeps the mantle going. Uh, there's something from the client. The client puts in a new demand that generates more concern and more intrigue. And I think I think the, the the role of the client is massive, and we mustn't lose sight of the importance of the client, so that the children can explore who the client is, um, talk with the client, meet with the client. So there's a whole body of work that you can, um, and a whole load of tasks that you can work with the children on the client alone. Because that, the client is a, a key part of Mantle of the Expert and one of the key elements. So we mustn't lose sight of the value of the client and what we can get from the client as, as, as far as the, the curriculum goes. There is a question, so yeah, isn't keeping, there? Yeah, keeping Mantle team, isn't it? But if, it, if it's going to be Mantle for a sustained amount of time, there must be team, commission, client, and what's the other one? Oh my God, it's gone out Task. of my mind. Tasks, yeah. Team commission and client, that must be there. And inquiry, that's the other one. Oh, oh sorry, Clara, you've got to leave. And I think Bishak and Bishani have left as well. Um, but um, we'll hopefully share the recording with you. Yona. And I was just saying about the client, really. It's, I've you know, thought about this. Um, and it does drive the work, as Dorothy always said. And I think sometimes the choice of clients as well, you know, you could, you, I, th I think Richard referred to it earlier, you know, I, I, what thing was Richard, uh, high status, low status, you know, what status is the client? And there are various statuses of client you can use, you know, you can use somebody with a great authority and you can use somebody who, um, you know, has very low status. But I think it's kind of finding in that client some element of vulnerability because, I just think the whole idea, and I've learned this from Brian, to be honest, is that caring about what the client wants is key. And as he was saying earlier on about caring for the work. So I think it's quite interesting to look at the nuances, I suppose, of what you mean by high status client, for example. It doesn't mean they have to, you know, they might know a lot and they might have high authority, but there's got to be something in that client or in that client's world, if you like. Maybe it's their world. Maybe they run an animal centre or rehabilitation. They maybe something like that. Um, that. It's got to be something that they care about, in a way, and feel that the children feel that they could do something about. Because I think you've got to be careful with a high authority role that doesn't have that element of bringing something that matters to children that they care about, and they feel we could do something about that. That they do need their help. So I think that, that's the whole area of the client, and I'm sure you'll expand on that in future sessions anyway. 
I think you're right. I think there has to yeah. be this need. They've got yeah. a need. They need yeah. the team right. in some way for some yes. reason. And the team are going to have to be competent enough to be able to do it. They could feel themselves as children in the as is world that it's something they could do. I think that's a very important factor. Otherwise, right. you lose them. You just lose them. Did you want to come you in, Brian? You know, sorry. Oh, you just said it, David. It was okay. the, the fact that it's a person in or people who need something. Mm. Which, with the, whether it's a giant who's got toothache who can't handle it, even though he's a big, scary giant. Whoever wh whoever it is, whether you call it... The prom one problem, I think, with the word client is it tends to push it into this sort of professional... And, and, and often it is like that, but it can be, you know, as I said, like a giant. It's someone or people who need something that they don't have or can't do, which then shifts the power relationship. No matter whether they've high status or low, whatever, doesn't matter. Uh, well, it does matter, of course, but they they need something which they don't have or can't do, and and that then positions the the children as able to help, and they always want to help. Well, well, and they, well, well, they only help if they care about it. Mm. It's back to that again. So yeah, that's that's why it's so tricky at the beginning because if you miss. Mm. If you get one of those things not quite right, the whole thing can sort of fall flat before you even begin. But that's why planning is so important. There is a question that comes up a lot, which is about time. And teachers saying, have we got time for this? Elaine talked earlier about um, you need time at the start to set up the team. And teachers, certainly in England, are under this pressure to deliver the curriculum, and the curriculum is so huge. And I think this is a government conspiracy, really. This is the plan to keep everyone busy. We've got to deliver this curriculum and get through it as fast as we can, and we don't have time, really, for anything other than to tell them, this is it, you've got to learn this, this is for the exam. So there is the question that comes up a lot about time, and how do we find the time for this? Um, Lisa, how do you find the time in the curriculum for when you've got so much to cover? I didn't want you, you to ask me this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's really, oh, sorry. We've, we've just put the kettle on, sorry. So we're going to turn it off. Um, there's so much coverage, isn't it? There's so much demand for covering so many things. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's because um, in English schools, we're under uh, the threat of, Ofsted and Ofsted want to see um, certain things and those certain things such as phonics and times tables take out a big chunk of time in the day and we can't ignore them. Um, so that's when we just have to be really creative and we have to make sure that we don't miss a minute of time. So we're always looking for connections between the curriculum and uh, this is where I said about blocking out time in a day. So um, we might block. So away from Mantle, we might have to block out a whole day and do a whole day on something like programming and computing, for instance, and just get it done so that then we've got more time, not more time, but we've got time uh, then to focus on Mantle. You have to I think you have to be creative. And maybe if you're working in a school where you have to have a set timetable that lists like an hour of history, an hour of art, an hour of DT, then that's where the big challenges come in. And that's certainly something that DFE and um, Ofsted are very subject. Um, they're looking for subjects, shall we say. So we have to be sure, I think, as the teachers as well, when we're doing Mantle, OK, if we're asked what subject is this? And if the children are asked, they know they're doing history as well as doing mantle, or they know they're doing science as well as doing mantle. Okay. I'm probably rambling now, sorry. No, no. I, 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 would say, I, I would say that with the onset of phonics in English schools and the demand for that, I've said to the early years teachers that as rigid as you have to be with that, in the other time that you have, be as creative as possible so that, that and and using that time that you then have um to to be as creative as you can 
is you know is a sign of how we think and how we value what the children can offer so i think that that's what that's what i would say as far as time goes if you've got a little bit of time make it as valuable as possible nikki um, made a comment in the chat she said oh, this horrible word covering we've got to cover the curriculum there's coverage and her she said um she prefers the word uncovering which i think is lovely lovely word um what are you going to say something Michelle? yeah i just wanted to say bye to everyone i oh. have to leave very sadly uh I, I have I'm, a class, but I'm joining in the other device. All right, you're not going in a car, are you, Bashar? <laughs> <at the moment? laughs> no. no? <laughs> Brian. Oh, I bye just bye. want to add uh, uh, for time. Um, I, I, there are two Greek words for time, which I find really helpful to think about. Chronos, which is the chronological idea of look at look at the clock. It's the time. You know, time is the enemy. It's marches on you have to do this it's phonics time or whatever it is um and the bell goes or whatever but, but the other the other word in greek is kairos which is the time it takes to do something the the time that's needed and if you think about mantle is all about the, the other world is the time it takes to do whatever you're doing you know you're working with a giant with a toothache you can't look up at the clock <laughs> it's like what's the time is needed to solve this part so it's the, i find that really helpful to think about which where where are we are we on chronological time or are we on the time it needs to take um and they're and they're both there um, but they're different they're completely different experiences of it so there's richard talking about you know talking to, talking to a kid in the just for a few minutes about what's been going on and they'll stand there for you know, and go on and on and on about what it is without this oh we got to go to whatever because they're in kairos time they're the time it needs to take to tell you about something that's important to me so yeah Great. really interesting that is brian i think because you know i've said this before when dorothy when i mentioned about Dr. to dorothy when she was making the work where we're doing the interview for what's in store you remember david and um and she and I said the teachers say they haven't got time for this, they have time for that. And and she's asked said, ask them what, what are they doing with their time? And it wasn't meant to be an arrogant statement. It it is a very interesting question, I think, given what Brian said about the two different types of time. You know, what are we doing with this time and how does it feel as well? How does it feel differently um, when you're doing sort of clock time or when you're doing the other kind of time? Um, and it is fascinating, really. But and obviously I added that you've got the now time of drama, haven't you? You know, which is a different time. It it's kind of more like the um the other kind of time, isn't it? It's not the clock time. It's that moment that you're in that world and engaged in that world, rather than sitting there looking at the clock, wondering when this hour will end. You know, it's it's attitudes to time is fascinating, really. I was listening this morning, as you do, to a, a video of Dorothy giving a talk in Dublin at an event where Cecily was also there. And, mm -hmm. and she talked about how there's what happens with the curriculum is it's sort of it's spread like thin butter over bread that's not very good because <laughs> it's so sort of it becomes she said this nice phrase, it becomes information and not wisdom mm, is what's being nice, communicated. Nice, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I just wanted to add to that, um, you know, just speaking to lots of people who are teachers who are, who are parents and also teachers, there was a, like a story that really struck me uh, during lockdown when all the, there was homeschooling and all the teaching online. One, one teacher took both their kids and just homeschooled them during lockdown and they found that they actually covered the curriculum so much quicker than, you know, what is taken in in school so sometimes it's helpful like what brian was saying there's a difference between the clock time and the time it takes to learn something and really a, a lot of the restriction comes from how regimented school timetables are um you know the, the subjects have to be this long you have to do one hour of art you have to do one hour of computing this week and you have to do so many hours of maths every week um, and that's how it is. That's how it is with the system. Um, but you can always kind of 
tease a bit of time here and there because I work, uh, I teach supplies. So I've been teaching in a whole range of schools. I come across all sorts of little things that are um, built into the week, the timetable that is not really curriculum. Like some schools would have news round every day, you know, for 15, 20 minutes, or they would have privilege time every Friday afternoon where the children can have um, they can play games and so on. So, you know, it usually, I, I understand it has to be negotiated with the, the management, the school management, but there is time to cover the curriculum. And I suppose you have to prioritize, you know, you do have to teach phonics, you do have to teach math and so on, but wherever you can, like Lisa was saying, you can bring up the mantle again and talk about it for 15 minutes just to keep it going in. And you don't have to feel the pressure, like Richard was saying, to link all the subjects in the curriculum or as many as you can into the mantle. As long as there is a mental project going, it keeps the children interested in learning. And as soon as they've had, oh, learning about teeth helps us to solve this problem with this giant who's in, you know, in so much pain, they make that connection between when they learn the serious stuff at one point, it's going to be really useful in a real life situation or in a mantle with a client and so on. So if you have that, even a little bit always helps, I think. So rather than feeling so much pressure, there's no time. You know, yes, you do have commitments as a teacher, but every little bit you can use is going to help. Common questions. Uh, the language is very important. We never talk about that, actually, right, Mansi? Yeah. We yeah, have, it... haven't spoken about the language, but I think that's that's a very important uh, point to discuss. Yeah. So, you... Oh, yeah. yeah you were saying... Huge part of the work, the 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 language and the language that you the, that you use. Um, you know, they talk about the language of induction of how you involve the children with you and I think I think that's key I think that's really really important um and it's you know it, it is this idea of you know listening and listening and listening and responding at the right moment and not being afraid of, of silences as well silences are really great opportunities for you to gather your thoughts as well as the as the children so don't be afraid of silence too so I, I think those different, it would be good to make a list of those different elements of mantle that um, you find interesting, that you have commonality with, and then reflect on those. I mean, something that we talk about an awful lot is what are we are ask, actually asking the children to do. You know, what is it we want them to do when they're when they're working within the story or without of the story? It's the it's the task. What what are we expecting the children to be doing? What will we see them doing? And I think that's that's something to constantly f reflect upon too. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. My one question would be like, uh, just to uh, add on to the time element, which I think Lisa, you very well said that you have to touch base every now and then, and you don't mm. leave it without exploring the concepts with kids. Um, on an average, like for example, I also teach in a school and I have my lesson for 55 minutes, not beyond that. And th the same group of children, I will not meet them before seven more days. Mm -hmm. So I have a pretty long gap when they come back. Uh, somewhere I feel even if, if I keep their written notes or the storyline or some document for, for them to refresh their memory, uh, they are not as charged as they were when that 55 minute lesson happened. Mm -hmm. So for me to touch base every time, uh, though it's interesting and they do come back by saying, you know, four weeks later, oh, is it that what we started on day one? They have that memory. But do you think so? It can be challenging. Like if there is such a long gap for me to always rewind progress and to, you know, continue a mantle. That is a biggest challenge. How much I try, I cannot meet them before that. <laughs> yeah, I think that is a really big challenge, actually. It, obviously, it's different for us. We're in a first school, so we see our children every day. Um, yeah. I mean, so when you when you see them, like, the next time, 
Um, do you do something like narrating? So what we might do if there's been a gap is we might just tell the story as if we were reading it from a book. So we'd almost say, say we were talking about the um, museum team. We talk about them in the third person. So we say the museum team, blah, 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 blah. And they met with blah, 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 blah. And they did this, blah, 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 blah. So we almost like tell the story to the children. So that doesn't take up too much time of the next session. I don't know whether that's anything you've done before. And the children will chip in with that, won't they? So no. yeah, and then they went to the church and they saw, didn't they? They did, they did, didn't they? And you say, yes, they did. And I wonder what happened next. And then you can carry on with it. So it's it's it, it is hard though because we we you, we are in the privileged position yeah. of seeing the children yeah. every day. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, um, we tried this uh, during the pandemic because we were completely online during pandemic. And what we did is we took up the um the episodic format. Yeah. So what we would do is we would do a recap of what has happened in the previous episode and then uh you know just like a tv show and move on to what is going to happen this episode yeah. and uh, maybe give them a little uh, bit of an idea of what are the possible spaces areas that we would explore in our next episode yeah so that had that had helped us Mansi, if you remember when we were doing just early the more the, when we went into uh, mm -hmm. the pandemic the lockdown mm -hmm. we actually took this format and we we worked on this format for for quite some time but then children get used to it mm. like children at uh, the first school they get used to the, the the whole idea of mantle i mean they can talk in that language yeah so i i think this recapping and what happens next uh, really helps it, it helps and gathers their thoughts Okay. Yeah, I found when I was in like in secondary schools and I only had fifty minutes or an hour mm. that it was um I, I I I was doing my usual mantle thing and it was just taking too long mm. um bef and the lesson would be over so the solution that we found. That worked for us anyway at that time was that we would go in and there would always be a problem, a key problem that the team had to address. And it had to be done by very much pressure of time. We had to solve this now. We've got this letter come from the client. We've got to sort this out. They need it now. And so we would have that. I found that way they were immediately into it again because they knew they had something to solve and something that they needed to work on quickly. And so it was something that could be done within one session. It's that episodic thing, exactly as you were saying, about Charlie. You know, you've got to make an episode of the last mm. session. Does them yeah, uh, give them some work to do to, you know, just kind of bridge that gap of six days or seven days and they come back? Do you think so? That also kind of strings them up and they're always in the in the grind of being in the mantle mentally also? Like just leave them with some something that they need to work on or create or think and then come back with their findings by the next class when we meet them. Uh, just have kind of a seed in their mind so that they're just not out of it. Do you think so that also helps? Definitely. I think that can help, yeah. Certainly, as long as they don't feel it's it's like homework, you know, as long yeah. as they are motivated and want to do it, want to bring it back. Oh, God, yes, can we sort this out? Can you have a go at looking at that or something? As long as it's within the mantle, I think. Um, I, think they, I think it's ensuring that they have that, it's a word we've heard a few times, the concern, and yeah. ensure that that concern is maintained. Yeah. Concern it's for for what they're doing, that concern for the client um, and concern for their own team is maintained somehow. And I think, you know, it, it would be good to do some thinking around this and, and how we could make that work for you. Uh, we are planning something. We, we plan to try something this year is to, in midweek, we plan to send some videos uh, of the teachers or the facilitators talking about the tension and maybe uh, talking a little bit more detailed about um, about uh, what may happen 
and what's what has happened and what may happen so we are planning to do that just midweek so if we're meeting on a sunday and then maybe on a wednesday or a thursday we have a little touch base of what's going on Brilliant. right now in in role and then mm-hmm. when they come back in then we take it from there so that there's at least one little you know hint of what has been going i mean what you are going into next in the next session mm. we're going to try i mean we i mean it's all uh, you know necessity is the uh, what uh, is the mother of creativity so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> invention is the mother yeah we know what you mean <laughs> yeah whatever that is but yeah. yeah i mean whenever we have this problem then we actually try to find practical solutions which work mm-hmm. for children in the uh, in today's world because now with uh, so much of multimedia and you know social media uh, that children are in with older students we have separate groups like we have a facebook page uh, we have an insta handle where you know we are having conversations mm-hmm. on that so with the, with the older ones we do have because they have access 15 plus have access to instagram so we do take our conversations from the classroom onto instagram and make it a part of uh, you know our our progress that way so let's see we're just trying that sounds good well, you sure don't anyone in they don't sort of um you don't have a connection with anyone that they see in the days when they don't see you is that right they yeah so they Yeah there isn't anyone else that you could try and get involved in the days in between they see you or yes we could we could we could do that ah, okay so that's also a possibility yeah mm. but surely your team are now advanced they've had training in mantle they've been developing mantle so it would be interesting yeah. to know from you if you uh, if we set up something that will support teachers what what you think your teachers need now your team uh, your practitioners what they need now i'm going to go out because i've got to bring everyone back together for the ending but maybe you can i don't know make some notes on that and send them to us so that we know yes, where I you agree. are at where you your team is at really what what right they might struggle we, with we are they... yeah right now we are heavily dependent on the mantle uh, network.com because we really go there we look at uh, all, all the mantles which have been uh, uploaded we uh, to be very frank we take the initial stages of of the lesson plan and then mm-hmm. it becomes our uh, own thing yeah. uh, so right. i think those starting points is uh, point, uh, point, pointers which are there in the mantle network uh, website are very helpful we have been using them and um, i think i i just discussed with lisa and richard uh, that we need a structured teacher reflection module so they have given us some ideas so mm-hmm. probably more structure bringing in more structure into the building creating and then reflection reflecting on the entire mantle uh, is Do something that you your um, that your team are ready to start to plan one from scratch then you think with some support yes we are ready to start we have tried a few we are ready to start yes yeah yeah because that's exactly the process we I'll call everybody back now David all right so yeah You'll have a minute to come back. It's in control of the breakout rooms. He's the boss, Roberta. Come on, Roberta. <laughs> I'm the boss. They'll yes. close down in 45 seconds. I'm so grateful for you to be doing this. If I, I just wouldn't have coped. <laughs> uh, people can come out themselves and they can wait for... 40 seconds and 30 seconds and they will come back. It always seems terrible that you know you, you know that these people are in the middle of a conversation and then they get summoned back. They actually sort of I've, when 19 seconds are up now they just be jerked back into this main room without any choice. Okay. And also you, you can make a voice of god announcement can't you Roberta? I know that you can say the the breakout rooms will close in 30 seconds. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, you can make a broad announcement. Yes, I never yes. tried that one before, but yeah, it sounds very bossy. <laughs> so we, we have tried it a lot with our students and it's really... <laughs> yeah. It's like the board coming onto your head. <laughs> nice yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh no. It's like Big Brother is watching. <laughs> <laughs> Are we all back? Uh, I don't think we're going to have time to share what we got, but our no. we will we will share uh, as a smaller group later what we got from our groups here. But thank you very much for taking part of it. I think David has some more words to finish it up before we reach the time. Are we all back? We are. Well, yeah, so Dorothy always used to say, give it a go. I know she'd say, well, give it a go at the end of the day if you've got a few minutes, and if it doesn't work, then that's fine. So just give it a go it's that um but i think she was aware that that's a risk thing for teachers it's a sort of maybe a scary thing to jump into it um what sort of it's interesting to know where because i was in one group and the group i was in they've got anasi and vaishali both were now very experienced but um what sort of range of experiences have we got in the groups so what have we found roberta about what about your group uh, we were with Tara, who's an experienced teacher as well. Uh, we had Natalia, uh, we had Laura, and we had Fran. Uh, so we have very experienced people. We have Laura who has a, a company. Uh, it's a, a startup that, that uh, tried to change the education in Brazil, basically, by teaching mm -hmm. teachers how to reach the children via the soft skills, via the 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 social area but she mm. says that they struggle a lot because as was, said here, as was said here today the it's half of the teachers to follow they have to follow the curriculum the government is really strict with it so the teachers get really stuck into what they have to do so it's very hard for them to go out of it and use mental but she sees her company teaches via practicing by putting their hands on so that's why mental is a very important tool for them to reach the teachers and teach them, to make them feel it and then help them to multiply it to the students. And we end up making a good meeting because Fran and I worked together in 2012, I think, in China. Uh, and so they, they met again here. And Fran says that she has some, she started to be interested in the work by uh, Tara, I, I think, and she started looking online for it and she had a brief experience in Mantle, but she wants to to get more from a, a group that would uh, that, that she could share her work and uh, feel that she's not alone. And I think it's the same with Natalia. She'll be pleased to share uh, her plans and get some suggestions to make sure that she's uh, using the amount of drama she should, how she should, just to feel that confidence to to boost the English in her students because she teaches English and she wants them to get more of the language and she feels that they struggle a lot with it. So how much could help her to teach them more and get them more involved. Okay, great. Yona and Brian, any observations from your session? Any well, things come up? Go on. Given the time, we'll, I think we should just go to the... the issues raised really. Yeah. I think all our group are very experienced in all so many different ways. And, you know, they, um, they're they obviously different, I don't know, stages, if you call it that. But, but the first, Leonard was raising a very interesting question about, is there a danger of over-preparing, you know, how you prepare, how you, sorry, how you prepare to protect yourself as a teacher starting off? So we, we, we gave him some responses to that, which are, which I'm sure and Brian particularly has some very concrete ideas that they, you know, they could use. And the other question they came up with was, uh, you know, the, the purpose of it getting the, and also questioning um, the, the importance of language in introducing anything at the beginning. So we talked about ways of wondering. And the other one was, um, you know, when, when with very young children, uh, that you know sometimes they they're all wanting to give ideas how you how you control that how you cope with that and brian was illustrating that through you know like stepping in and stepping out to the world and ways of doing that which which are also connected to um the idea that uh, was brought up about real you know some people think that, that the drama is real or it, is it is it real or is it not real they're not sure which world they're in so Again, Brian, you know, you 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 gave really great um, ideas about that. 
Brian, do you want to add anything? Um, no, I think you got that. You know, just well, just, just the, that question yeah. about what world are you in? Yes, it's, yes. It's very important to, yes. you've got to know where you are yeah. and, and check in with the children. Yes. So that if somebody's, if we're in the classroom world talking about it and a kid suddenly jumps in and pretends to be a T-Rex, you know, you got to, are we all going to join that or are we going to talk mm. about it? Sort of, it's like, where are we? And the kids don't have a problem with that. Well, a child doesn't, but it mm. can be a teacher problem. Mm. Um, but, yeah. but just yeah. where are we, you know? And, and we talked about like Dorothy's givens and negotiables in planning. So the more givens you yeah. have when you're planning and, and the, talk about the example of the map, um, you yeah. know, the more protected you are. So, you know, and how far you negotiate and taking it a step at a time, you know, five minutes before the bell or whatever. I think that was in that group. I can't remember. But that's summing it all up. I'm sorry I'm not talking about individual experiences, but I didn't have time for that. I thought this was important to feed in. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Emma. Thanks very much. Right. Um, Richard and Lisa, and just I know, Richard, you posted something in the chat. Do you just want to feed back on that? Yeah, we're just trying to summarise in the chat in case the time ran out. Um, so in our group, we were talking about the, um, how useful it would be to get together to have a structured teacher reflection time as practitioners um, and also maybe one of the focuses of, of those meetings could be on the use of language so the teacher use of language in mantle and also about how you make the move from we all I think or most of us maybe start when we're working with mantle with a plan that's already there or a mantle that's already been done um, and we make it our own. So then how can we make that move to start from scratch, really? So supporting each other to plan from scratch. Those were the main things. We talked about time as well. So it would be good to have some um, experiences from uh, teachers who are working with children and they don't see them again for another week, how you can try and keep and sustain the mantle when you don't see the children for a, a week or so. Mm. Right. That was the main summary. So we're looking at ways of developing offerings that will help support teachers. And we do plan to start a group or groups maybe in the autumn. So what we will do now is we will meet again as a group and we will look through the observations, comments, questions, experiences. Um, and it was really important for us to open this up and to find from teachers who are interested in Mantle what they need. There's that lovely uh, thing that Dorothy used to say, um, and I do sort of keep it in mind a lot. It's never forget to remember what you've forgotten you know. So what do people need? I mean, if I've been doing Mantle for so many years, maybe I'm not sort of so in tune with what people need what you need if you're starting out for example so it's really important that we get we talk to people it's dialogue as you would say brian in your book it's about dialogue so thank you very much everyone for coming thank you for all the team for their contributions and for everyone for coming here today and um i've really enjoyed it i hope you have as well so we'll thank see you all again you. soon thank you everybody Thank you. Thank you very much for coming, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye, everyone.